Welcome. We are going to begin talking about protist evolution, the things that evolved first in protists, um, how protists evolve, and why they're important in our evolutionary history. And we're going to start by first outlining what are these key eukaryotic features that first evolved in protists. The first one is a nucleus. All right. Obviously, bacteria did not have a nucleus. Remember that eukaryotes also have membrane-bound organelles. These evolved in protists, and in particular in protists, we will focus on the mitochondria and the chloroplast. And how those evolved by this, um, through endosymbiosis. True sexual reproduction also evolved in protists. And by that, we mean meiosis and fertilization. And protists were also the first organisms to evolve multicellularity. All right, we'll take a look at a few of these in depth. We will not really take a look at the nucleus, membrane-bound organelles, or multicellularity. Just know that those evolved in protists for the first time. We're going to start by taking a look at true sexual reproduction, and the way that most protists do this is through alternation of generations. So the way that alternation of generations works. You start with a diploid zygote. Remember that 2N means that it is diploid. If it is diploid, it has two sets of chromosomes, right? Our human body cells are diploid. This zygote, or the starting cell for our protist, is diploid, right? That um, zygote goes through mitosis to become multicellular and create, in this case for a slime mold, a feeding plasmodium, right? That keeps going through mitosis, growing larger and larger. This is an example of a slime mold, if you haven't seen it before, right? And eventually, those, um, slime molds will create a sporangium. Now the sporangium is kind of like um, the reproductive organ of the slime mold and inside this sporangium it goes through meiosis. Right? And so after meiosis it now has spores and these spores are haploid. Right? meaning they only have one set of chromosomes. This is like in our sperm and our egg cells. Right? These spores then germinate, and it can create um, additional cells. What is different in these um, slime molds that have alternation of generations is that the haploid generation can live on their own. This would be like if human egg cells or human sperm cells could exit the body and have their own lives separate from their parents, right? That's not the case for us. The reason it's called this alternation, oh, let me back up. Then when these two types of haploid cells join together, we have fertilization and we go back to our diploid zygote. The reason this is called alternation of generations is because we alternate between a diploid generation and a haploid generation. Okay. We see this not just in slime molds, but also things like seaweeds. So this is one way that um, our protists can actually have that true sexual reproduction. We also see this kind of sexual reproduction, alternation of generations in things like mosses and ferns. All right, so now let's talk about the theory of endosymbiosis. The theory of endosymbiosis states that the mitochondria and chloroplasts arose or came to be when one cell engulfed another. So what does that look like? Let's, all right, so we're going to start here with our heterotrophic eukaryote. That is like our um, animal-like protus. And what you can see happening here is that that heterotrophic eukaryote is engulfing a cyanobacterium. Now a cyanobacterium is a photosynthetic bacteria. And so 
the eukaryotic cell, the protist, takes in the bacteria through endosymbiosis, okay, um, and through endocytosis. And what ends up happening is that instead of the cell digesting the bacterium, the bacterium ends up living, kind of coexisting inside the um, protist that engulfed it, okay. Um, this can happen just once, all right, it can happen multiple times. What we think happened first is that the mitochondria evolved this way first, and then the chloroplast, all right. Um, so let's take a look at some pieces of evidence that we have that this is how we know that um, mitochondria and chloroplast evolved this way. Okay. So our first piece of evidence that we have for this is that chloro mitochondria and chloroplast, which I'm just going to ab abbreviate M plus C, have their own circular DNA. just like a bacteria does. And I forgot to mention the the reason we could have one um, bacteria getting engulfed to make a mitochondria and the other going to a chloroplast is that it was a photosynthetic bacteria that went to a chloroplast and a non-photosynthetic bacteria that got um, co-opted into being a mitochondria. All right, So these have their own circular DNA. They also have their own ribosomes. which are more similar to a bacteria's ribosomes than they are to a eukaryote's ribosomes. Mitochondria and chloroplasts also reproduce through binary fission. And they do this on their own, not during mitosis. And binary fission is the same method that bacteria use to asexually reproduce. And then lastly, and this was actually our first clue that we had that mitochondria and chloroplasts evolved this way, um, mitochondria and chloroplasts have a double membrane. All right, so if we have our host cell here and our bacteria, and the host cell engulfs the bacteria. What happens is you have the bacteria with its own membrane and then the host cell's membrane around it. And so there's actually a double membrane around these mitochondria and chloroplast. If we think about this, the other uh, organelle that would have evolved through endosymbiosis because it has a double membrane is our nucleus. All right. So those are our evidence for mitochondria and chloroplast evolving via endosymbiosis. Right? Endosymbiosis like this also allows branches of our evolutionary tree to merge. We usually think about an evolutionary tree having nice, discrete branches that don't come back together. Okay? However, that is not the case for protists. So what you can see is here we have a heterotrophic eukaryote through endosymbiosis. It ends up becoming a photosynthetic algae because it has engulfed a uh, photosynthetic bacteria. What happened then is that that algae got engulfed by another heterotrophic bacteria or another heterotrophic protist, right? And so now you end up with a protist that is heterotrophic, meaning it can eat other organisms and has chloroplasts, and so it can photosynthesize. This is how we got things like euglena, like you saw in lab, all right? Um, and the way we know this happened is because the mitochondria and chloroplasts here have three layers of membranes, all right? Um, so in this way, we ended up getting an evolutionary tree where animals went this, animal-like protists went this way, plant-like protists went this way, and then, because of endosymbiosis, the branches end up coming back together. And so we can end up actually having a um, phylogenetic tree that is more net-like than discreetly branching, okay, because these branches can kind of merge back together in a variety of ways for our protists. And that actually leads us to the next somewhat challenging question, is protists and classification, All right? So protists historically have kind of been the junk drawer or leftovers 
of the Linnaean classification system. We all have that drawer in our kitchen where we throw the things that we don't know what to do with. Maybe for you, it's the space under your bed. Either way, it's where we put the things we don't know what to do with. And protists have typically been unicellular, not animals or plants. Okay, but this is not a great definition. Defining something by what it is not doesn't really tell you what it is, okay? So what has made protists so hard to classify? One reason is that protists are small. And that may seem fairly obvious, but other than the things like seaweeds, most are small. We have to use a microscope to see them. We don't encounter them on a daily basis, and a lot of them look kind of the same to us. So whereas we can differentiate easily between an elephant and a giraffe because they're big enough for us to see, it's hard for us to differentiate between a paramecium and a blepharisma because we don't see them very often. Okay. Another reason, reason that protists are hard to classify is that for most of them, after they die, they don't leave fossils which means there is no fossil record for most of them. There are some that still leave fossils, but there's no fossil record for us to see how they evolved over time. All we can see is how protists look, act, and what their genetics are right now, not what they were in the past, okay? Um, protists also, like we saw some with the endosymbiosis, um, do something called horizontal gene transfer, meaning they can exchange traits. There is also evidence that these protists can lose their traits over time. Um, some of the organisms that we thought were bacteria, there is actually evidence now that they used to be eukaryotes and have evolved to not have a nucleus anymore, like our red blood cells. Okay. Um, protists are also difficult to classify because they are so diverse and because they've been treated as the junk drawer for so long. All right. Um, there are several other reasons why protists are hard to classify. This is uh, a few of them. Okay. So now these days when we talk about it, protists are typically not referred to as a kingdom um, by most higher level scientists. And why is that? Part of that is again, the diversity. They are just so much more diverse than any other kingdom that we have that it doesn't make sense to put them all in one group. Another reason is because scientists are now discovering their genetics. We can now sequence the DNA of something without even seeing it under a microscope. And with their genetics, we can uncover their evolutionary history. And so now we are grouping um, our protists based on how they're related, not just how they look or how they eat. And then lastly, one of the big reasons is that it's currently thought that plants, animals, and fungi evolved from protists, which means they can't be on the same classification level as protists if we're talking about relatedness, all right? That would be like you and your grandparents being on the same level in a family tree, which just doesn't make sense, all right? Um, so we don't have a good, easy to use classification system for protists yet, but this is likely to continue to change over time as we learn more and um, solidify what we know about their relatedness and their history. All right, and that is it for protist evolution.